message in the series, and it's called Three Kinds of Peace. That's an, open, that's an interesting opening statement. There are three kinds of peace. Peace. I think most of us, if not all of us, desire peace. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you desire peace. When I think of peace, I think first of all, spiritual peace. By spiritual peace, I mean peace with God. You can't truly know peace until you establish peace with God. The Apostle Paul in Romans 5 verse 1 says this, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In order to understand any form of peace, or should I say, in order to have a lasting peace, we have to get peace with God. That's paramount. We have to get peace with God. We have to make sure that our vertical relationship is correct in order for the horizontal relationships to be in place. The horizontal will never be in place unless the vertical is right. Secondly, when I think of peace, I think of the need for emotional peace. We have to have peace with God which is spiritual peace, then we need to understand the peace of God, which is, sorry, then we can understand the emotional peace, which is found through the peace of God. Now, this emotional peace is what most of us think of when we think of the word peace. It is an internal sense of well-being, an internal sense of well-being and order. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3, 15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since you were called to peace. Do you know that we have been called to peace? This is what the Bible says. We have been called to peace. We are called to have peace. I think even in the garden, when Adam and Eve broke peace through their decisions, even though there are consequences in that they're expelled from the garden, etc., etc., There was still God's desire to bring peace. They were naked. Blood was spilt, but he covered them. Now, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in you. In the original translation, that is the word rule transferred from the Greek. And the word rule doesn't mean like, I'm going to beat you or have control of you. But the word rule literally means in the Greek, it might be a better word would mean to umpire. A better word would be, let the peace of Christ be the umpire of your hearts. That would be a better translation. We need to allow God's peace to umpire our lives. What do umpires do? They, they keep the peace. They keep the balance. They make sure that the game is played in a correct, smooth, and orderly manner. And God wants our lives to be done in a correct, orderly manner. God wants to give us an internal umpire who will keep us at peace even when everything around us seems chaotic. Chaotic. Have you ever heard anyone say, I need to get away. I need to run away. I need to escape. Ever heard that? Ever said it yourself? There are probably people who aren't here today who don't have peace. And instead of running into God's presence, they've run from God's presence. Instead of running into the house of believers, somehow they think by running away, they can find peace. You cannot run away from yourself because peace is not something you can run to. It is something you have to find within yourself. You need spiritual peace and you need emotional peace. And the third area that I believe is important, and I say it deliberately in these orders because I believe one 
is with God. Two is with your emotions in itself. And the third area of peace is so important is what I call relational peace or peace with other people. Paul says in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, say possible. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, say depends on you. Notice it doesn't say depends on the other person who's grieved you. Did you notice that? Because often we say we can't have peace with them unless they say sorry, unless they change their action, unless they... Now, I'm not saying peace gives you trust again because you've got to earn trust. And I believe that. But Paul says here, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. See, Paul's saying... As far as it depends on you, it's it's up to you. It's up to the hardness of your heart. It's up to your ability to let go. Now, peace doesn't mean you put yourself back in a circumstance or an environment that causes you damage. But what it's saying here is that if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. How many know that relational peace reduces conflict? We don't need conflict. Hello. We don't need, we should be able to agree to disagree and still be at peace. It doesn't have to be venomous. It doesn't have to be mean. It doesn't have to be nasty. We don't have to call each other names. We don't have to question someone's salvation because they voted one way to another way. We don't have to go down that path. That's up to God to work it out. There's nothing wrong with sharing your view, but in sharing your view, don't make it that if they don't accept, then they're somehow evil. We all know that from experience, we've all had experience, relationships can be a source of stress. Has anybody found stress through a strained relationship? Okay. Thank you. Sometimes I wonder if it's all by myself. That's why I respond to all my own altar calls, okay? For most of us, our problems are people problems. Getting along with the boss, the family, the relatives. We must deal with conflict, competition, criticism, on a regular basis because these things look to rob us of peace. How desperately we need spiritual, emotional and relational peace. But can we really find it? Already, there are several of you saying, I need that right now spiritually. I don't feel peace with God. I need that right now emotionally. In myself, it's a turmoil. Emotionally, I don't feel peace. You might be saying that right now, relational. Right now, there's not a relational peace. But we have to understand the promise of God's peace. In John 14, 27, listen to the promise of Jesus. I leave behind with you peace. I give you my own peace. And my gift is nothing like the peace of this world. Thank you, Jesus. The Roman peace was called Pax Romana, Roman peace. We don't need that, okay? You must not be distressed and you must not be daunted. Now, Jesus spoke these words not long before he went to the cross. I leave behind with you peace. I give you my own peace and my gift is like nothing it's, it's nothing like the peace of this world. You must not be distressed and you must not be daunted. Jesus says that the peace he has is a gift to us who believe. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. And we can't psych ourselves up for it. You ever seen Christians psyching themselves up for things? It scares me. We cannot try really hard to get it because it is a gift that we have to receive. 
Jesus says that his peace is different to the peace the world gives us. The world's peace is fragile. The peace of this world is temporary. But God's peace is not related to circumstances. God's peace allows us to be tranquil in the midst of trouble. So how do we get this peace? How do I tap into it? I want it. How do I get it? I've noticed, I've noted five keys that I feel help to acquiring God's perfect peace. The first one is this. Obey God's principles. You can be born again and not have peace. Born again is the free gift. If you want the blessed marriage, you've got to work at it in God. If you want to succeed financially, you have to work at it in God. So it goes through. Now, I believe by grace it's already done. But you have to have faith to tap in and pull on it and do it. If we want peace, we have to understand what it is to obey God's principles that are found in his word. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 165 and verse 167, it said this, Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Verse 167 says, I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. God says that peace comes when we live in harmony with him. When we do what he tells us to do, you say, well, that's old covenant. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey. We have to follow the principles. Now, sometimes we don't want to follow the principles because it means getting it right, putting things in order. It's like we've done something wrong and we've hidden it and this peace of God is saying, deal with it. And we resist it. It's all about obeying God's word. Secondly, I believe is this. If you want God's peace, it's not only obeying his word, but it is accepting God's pardon, being able to forgive yourself. His forgiveness is release from punishment. Now, I'm not saying that if you've done something terribly wrong, okay, when you ask God's forgiveness, that there are no longer consequences. I'm not saying it removes you of the consequences. But I am saying it gives you peace that you've dealt with it in the right way. I've been with many a person who have felt compelled to deal with issues. And God has forgiven them, and I've walked with them to authorities to deal with things. Some of them had nothing else done, and some of them went to do a jail sentence, greatly reduced, but they did it and they had peace. Now that's extreme cases, but I'm telling you, that's when I truly know that God's at work. That's the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is, well, I'm sorry because I got caught. Godly sorrow is, I didn't even know they did it, but they came forward and wanted to get with it. Godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. It doesn't mean that someone's been caught can't change, but I'm just saying in general, worldly sorrow is, okay, I'll come clean because you caught me. But godly sorrow is, I want to deal with it, Pastor. I want to deal with it. What did that? They want peace. What was the key? First of all, okay, they wanted to obey God's word. Secondly, they wanted to fully understand what it is to accept God's pardon. God's pardon is more important than dealing with the world. You deal with that, then it flows down. See, guilt is the number one destroyer of peace for most of us. When we feel guilty, we feel we're being haunted and being chased by our past. What if someone finds out? What if someone sees the skeleton in the closet? <laughs> All you need is to run for politics and we'll find out every single skeleton you have. You've got to have a lot of courage or stupidity to run even in this even local government. That's why we find out in newspapers about people who 30 years after the fact have to make restitution for the wrong they committed. They say, I was living in hell for 30 years and had to get off my chest. That's an a, a uh, interesting statement, hell, okay? But that's in my January seasons at night, okay? We won't go into there. But I was living in hell for 30 years and had to get it off my chest. 
And the only way to have peace of mind is to have a clear conscience, and only God can give that. I like this scripture in Micah 7, verse 18. It says, Who is God like you? Who pardons sins? Who forgives transgressions? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. We have the wrong image of our God. We see him more as somebody who wants to beat us up rather than a father who delights in showing mercy. Yeah. Micah is saying that God is eager, that God is willing, that God is waiting to clean our slate. Yeah, right. It is God's nature. He likes to forgive. 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he's unfaithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I know, I know some today in, in all the extreme grace will tell you that, that was just written to Gnostics, but it's written to the church with Gnosticism in the church. And it's talking about dealing with sins. God's forgiveness is available. And if you don't have a clear conscience, we'll give you a chance to start with one. The next one is this. Focus on God's presence. That's P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, not a present, presence. If we want God's peace, focus on God's presence. Realize that God is always with us and learn to be aware of his presence. He's always there with you. Always. Whether you feel it or don't feel it. It's great when your relationship with God has a feeling. Nothing wrong with a feeling, a good feeling. You might feel a goosebump, or you might feel a shiver, or you might feel an emotion. There's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. It's okay. You might feel tears. You might feel that. All those things are okay. Just don't base your relationship on that feeling because there will be days when you don't have a feeling. We have to realize that God is always with us and we have to learn to sense his presence. It's called spiritual awareness. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 26, verse three, he says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. This is a great scripture. Listen to it. You will keep in perfect peace him, her, whose mind is steadfast. Steadfast is sound mind. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to patterns will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember I shared last week, we've got to get control of our thoughts. We have to get control of our thoughts. This is reiterating it here. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he's trust in you. We have a choice. You focus on the issue, the problem, or you focus on God who holds the solution. The problem doesn't have a solution. The problem is detrimental. The psalmist said this in Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. That's a great scripture. How many know that scripture? Very good. How many are aware also of Psalm 46.10? Be still and know that I am God. How many know that one? Yeah. And how many knew this? David didn't write it. Hezekiah did. Ah, I got you. <laughs> David didn't write that psalm. King Hezekiah did. He wrote it many years after David. And when he wrote it, the nation of Israel had been destroyed. It was split in two. There was a nation of Israel and Judah. And Israel had been already destroyed by the Assyrians around about 726 BC. This is before the Babylonians in around about 586. The Babylonians, the Assyrians were all in the area today that we would call Iraq. And the Assyrians had destroyed Israel. And now their king, the king of Assyria, thought he was God. 
And he brought his huge army and he surrounded the capital, Jerusalem. And the Israelites were uptight. They were scared. They were fearful. And the Assyrian king sent heralders and messengers and said, don't trust the God of your king. The God of your king, Hezekiah, does nothing. He's deaf. But you trust in your new God, the king of Assyria. Get rid of your king. I'll have mercy on you. This guy was belligerent. And he worked to steal peace. And in the midst of this, he wrote Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. He wrote, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. You think you had a bad day. It's nothing in comparison to what they had. They knew that unless God intervened, they were going to get whooped. And they prayed out to God. Five minutes before noon, God smote the enemy with a plague. And the Bible says 185,000 died. They had to regroup and move out. Jerusalem was saved. Everybody was happy. And the psalm reminds us today that God is our refuge, that God is our strength, no matter how overwhelming the odds seem, that he is an ever-present help. The psalm tells us two things about getting God's help in time of trouble. The first thing that psalm tells us is this, be still when we are in trouble. Be still. Still your mind. Still your thoughts. Still your mouth. Still it. Stop. Stop having the last word. Stop trying to get revenge. Stop trying to work it out. Stop. In the Hebrew, it means ease up. Let go. In addition to telling us to be still, the Lord reminds us and know that I am God. Obey God's principles. Accept God's pardon, his forgiveness. Focus on God's presence. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 4, 7. Thanks, Lisa. The next one is this. Trust God's purpose, number four. If we want to experience God's peace, we have to trust God's purpose. Even when things do not make sense, we must trust the purpose of God. And we know this scripture in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Now I know we know it. But there are four verbs in these verses. Trust. Lean, brackets, not. Not lean on it, but not lean on God, saying, but lean not on your problems. So trust, I'm gonna use it as one. Lean not, acknowledge, direct. These are the four verbs. If you got that scripture highlighted, get a different highlighter color pen and just under, underline those words so it stands out. Trust, lean not, acknowledge, direct. Now the first three verbs are commands. The commands are trust God. The command is don't lean on your problems. And the third command is acknowledge that I am your God. But the fourth verb is a promise. God will direct your paths. The first three are commands. It tells us trust lean not, acknowledge, and then we're given a promise and God will direct your paths. These are keys in how we receive and stay in peace. Finally, fifth is this. 
Have you noticed that many things in life just don't make sense? <laughs> if you're an American, you'd be saying that especially right now, right? And do you feel that a lot of things in life are beyond your control? You can't control how the other person is reacting. You can't control. So what do you do in these situations? Trust. The writer of Proverbs urges us to trust God, not to depend on our own understanding. He reminds us to acknowledge God, to recognize and accept that God is sovereign, means rules, in control of the universe. If God is sovereign, ruling of the universe, it also means that the part of the universe that you and I inhabit, He also is sovereign, rules over. So we must acknowledge that God is in control and our God does not make mistakes. Everything that happens in our lives fits into a plan that God has for us and that He will use every situation, even the problems, the heartaches and the difficulties that we bring upon ourselves to work out His promise in our lives. He fits everything perfectly into His plan for us. All that God expects is that we trust Him without trying to figure everything out. Acknowledge that God is in control. When we do this, you have this promise that He will direct our lives. Or as the New International Version says, He will make your paths straight. Proverbs 3 verse 6. I think of Peter, the apostle, in Acts 12, 1 to 19. He was arrested by King Herod. He was put in prison. He was to be executed in that morning. And the night before Peter was to be executed, God sent an angel to rescue him. The Bible says in verse 7 that the angel had to wake him up. The Bible had to give him a kick. Get up, Peter. So what's the big deal? He was about to be executed and he was sleeping like a baby. That's because he was trusting in God who's directing his life. It's peace, real peace. The Bible said, I'll give my beloved peace. I'll give them sleep. At night I say, Lord, you promise that those who trust in you will sleep. I refuse to believe that in the night hours when the enemy does his best to attack you because you're not busy with fears and anxiety, that his peace comes upon you. If you want God's peace, you gotta ask for it. In Philippians 4, 6 to 7, Paul says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Prayer and petition, it says. This is a cause and effect relationship. Prayer is the cause, peace is the effect. Prayer is the cause, peace is the effect. If you're not praying, you're likely to be worrying. And worry is a useless emotion, it's a waste. When pressure builds up, don't panic, pray. Prayer is tremendous stress reliever. So many people are running out here to find out what to get. I need to grab this, I need to grab that, I need to grab this. We got to stop planting seeds in here that will work its way out. But whether they be pastors or else, we think that there's fruit on someone else's tree that somehow we need to access. What do you want prayer for? Pastor, I want peace. What do you want prayer for? I want boldness. What do you want prayer for? I'm against pray against anger. What do you want prayer for? Soundness of mind. Listen. There's not an instant lay on the hands, fairy godmother, sprinkle gold dust on your head and you walk away with it because you're just lazy. You want to eat someone else's fruit. Well, pastor, I see peace in you. Can you give me some of that? Pastor, I see faith in you. Can you give me some of that? Pastor, listen, that's my own fruit. Where were you when I was tending my garden? What I'll pray is that you begin to feed what you have. And this pastor said, well, how do I get it? And I said, how's your quiet time? It's good. I said, well, what are you reading? Nothing. I said, listen, 
Not all readers lead, but all leaders read. Not all readers lead, but all leaders read. What are you reading? Nothing. So I gave him books. That other guy gave him books. I said, you got to change what you're putting into that thick skull. What's rubbing you a piece? Is it guilt? Turn to God for forgiveness. Is it worry? A job change? Finances? Major surgery? A difficult person? You can talk to Jesus about all of these things and anything else that is bothering you. What's your deepest fear? Loneliness? Failure? Death? Illness? Change? Responsibility? In uh, 1892, the guy died in 1971. I just can't pronounce his name too well. His name is uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. He's an American theologian. Not a real very big American name, but American theologian. And he wrote this, and today they've used it, and they call it the serenity prayer. He never called it the serenity prayer, but they call it that. And he wrote this. God... Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. That's a great statement. God create, sorry, God grant me the serenity, the peace, the ability to accept the things I cannot change but also the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know that. I think the most powerful part there is the wisdom to know the difference. There are some things you can't change. So have peace. Have peace. But at the same time, maybe there's something you can change. Then have the wisdom to bring about that change. But my prayer over us all is that we'd have the wisdom to know the difference.